First plenary speaker this morning is Stan Brown. Uh, Stan Brown is part of a dynamic duo, uh, Stan and Tammy Brown, otherwise known as the Stammy Brown family. Uh, Stan has uh, was an MK uh, growing up, as was his wife Tammy. They spent, uh, as I recall, about 10 years working in Kenya and some time in Turkey. And uh, for the last about 17 years, have been in Kazakhstan. Around 15 years ago, they started a, a, a program to serve small-scale farmers uh, that were developing orchards. And uh, Stan has been here before, Stan and Tammy, and have shared some about their work in Kazakhstan. And they have uh, taken it in a new direction recently, and they're trying to develop a commercial orchard alongside their kind of NGO work, uh, supporting small-scale farmers to start, operate, and improve orchards. And uh, any of you that have had experience trying to do a business alongside a nonprofit recognize that there's the potential for richness and also challenge and conflict uh, between the two. And so Stan has graciously agreed to come back to ECHO and give us a little bit of an update and talk about this new dimension in their work and ministry. Please welcome Stan Brown. Thank you. It's good to be back here. Uh, Danielle Echo has been very significant uh, for us. Um, Three, yes, three out of five uh, of our expat teammates over the years have been recruited through ECHO. Um, in fact, our, our most solid recruit, Patrick Brady, who I, I wish could be here again, he presented with me uh, back in 2006. Um, he was on the island of Niwe. Uh, was in the States, visit. he was doing uh, vanilla production uh, development work on the little tiny island of Niue in the South Pacific. Happened to be in the U.S. and visited Urbana and visited the Echo Desk. Uh, we had uh, interacted with Echo through Lindsay and uh, she had uh, very kindly passed on information to Patrick. I called Patrick from Kazakhstan, would wake him up at 2 in the morning to try and recruit him. He finally got so tired of me waking him up at 2 in the morning that he came and joined us. But Echo has been very significant. I'd like to get right into our talk here. Um, Orchards in Middle Earth, Nonprofit and Commercial Orchard in Tandem. Look at that picture. We'll look at it again in the end. It's a very significant picture of what we're doing. But first of all, uh, why Middle Earth? Uh, we're located actually just northwest of Mordor, just south of the Northern Waste in Kazakhstan, Central Asia. Indeed, if you, uh, the map's not uh, too good there, but uh, if you can see, uh, Mordor is that little uh, circle, the second largest shifting de sand desert in the wor in the, on the earth uh, in northwest China called Xinjiang, and indeed uh, it's Mordor. Uh, the northern waste, of course, is Siberia, north of us. Uh, Tolkien uh, made his map of Middle Earth just by sort of turning it on its side. And uh, indeed, we feel like we are in Middle Earth, but otherwise, we're not allowed to mention hobbits or anything else. Middle Earth is public domain, and so we'll stick to Middle Earth. The Middle Earth, uh, Central Asia, fruit growing regions of southeastern Kazakhstan. We've also had impact uh, through training programs in adjacent fruit growing areas of Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Xinjiang in western China. 
Central Asia is known for its extremes, geography, history, people, and wealth. High mountains, steppe, and desert predominate. Within several thousand miles, the Earth's second highest point, second lowest point, and second largest shifting sand desert can be found. Average climate goes from 30 or 40 high to 0 to minus 10 low, but in fact we can have 50 high and minus 35 low. Rainfall varies from 50 centimeters to less than 10 centimeters. Huns, Scythians, Mongols, and Turks, personified by people like Attila, Genghis Khan, and Tamerlane, explored by Marco Polo and before him Ibn Battuta, the Arab explorer, and before him at the uh, turn of the, well, about 140 BC actually, Xiang Qin, the Chinese explorer, explored Central Asia. It's the possible origin of the domestic horse, the wheel, and indeed possibly the domestic apple. Over a hundred different ethnic groups are found in Central Asia. Most of them shipped in by Stalin. It was a pretty empty place until, until Stalin started filling it up with uh, all the people that he didn't trust on the edges. Well, we have Koreans from the Far East. We have Poles, Ukrainians, Turks, Chechens, Greeks, and on and on. They're all in Central Asia. Billionaires, it's an oil economy. Billionaires and oil wealth con con contrast with deep poverty. We've operated a non-profit ag development uh, program officially since 1998, and we've focused exclusively on fruit orchard development since 2003, or for about 10 years now. The non-profit, uh, we've had success. We've established the most effective orchard training program in Central Asia. We have very good government uh, relations. Team of five expat families recruited, uh, representing three partnering organizations. Local staff of 10 trained, 60 new orchards started, 12 communities impacted, 30 skilled workers trained. Uh, directly and in partnership, participated in the establishment of 10 new church gatherings, assisted and supported translation of a New Testament, discipleship materials, and then bonus impacts have included health care, sports programs, and computer training. Every year we have a bicycle race, uh, usually over three days. That includes uh, all our local staff, friends, and uh, usually expats of about four or five different uh, nations organized by my colleague, uh, Patrick. So if you like cycling, come to Central Asia. In 2009, we started commercial operations, opening a US company and a Kazakhstan company. Um, now, why did we do this? We, were having, we have a successful nonprofit going. Well, first of all, we were responding to demand by landowners uh, who had come to us. They, they saw the, our work and uh, they said, uh, please help us. And we said, well, you've got some means, you've got some land, so um, you'll need to pay us to do it. But uh, we started thinking about this and we've been facing challenges as all nonprofits do. Nonprofit funding is always limited Nonprofit funding is always conditional. And nonprofit funding is demands resources that we could otherwise be using, we felt, in our actual work. But also, a commercial option offers a growth opportunity and a scalability that's not always present in a nonprofit. Nonprofit growth and scalability is limited by funding resources and logistics. Uh, commercial growth and scalability is theoretically limited only by opportunity and management resources. Now I'm speaking specifically to our own 
experience in our own context. Um, so I'm not trying to generalize here. But uh, we work in areas of vast geographic distance. We are, work in areas with very rich landowners and very, very poor subsistence farmers. And so in that context, uh, our growth is limited on the nonprofit side compared to what it could be on the commercial side. And yet there's need and there's opportunity that it keeps drawing us. Credibility, uh, in our context, again, well-managed commercial activity is often more credible in a global context than nonprofit NGOs that are often suspected of having ulterior political or religious purposes even if we operate transparently, which we attempt to do. There's another factor, efficiency. Businesses live or die on being able to survive on being efficient, whereas nonprofits are able to be less efficient in a business sense because the goals are different, uh, the measures, the metrics are different. We can afford to take our time in a nonprofit uh, to uh, bring training, whereas a business has to survive on its making profit. Those are efficiencies that can be very useful. Impact. All of you in the nonprofit agricultural development uh, context understand how difficult it is to get a farmer to adopt what you're trying to teach them. You've seen it in your own context. You've seen it in an efficient agricultural context. And you're trying to get this farmer who's operating with 200, 300, 400 year old technology to move a little bit forward and become more efficient, feed himself and his community better. But farmers are conservative. They, all, they are all over the world for good reason. Uh, you don't want to experiment with something that's going to destroy your crop for the next year. Well, a farmer who sees something happening, and this is where our nonprofit demonstrations come in, will respond faster. We've seen that farmers respond even faster when they see a competitive commercial operation right next door. Like all farmers, like all uh, business people and people concerned with their own resources and generating their own resources, farmers will respond with competition. And so profit does speak. Now, this is where we down, get down to the nitty gritty. In our own experience, we've faced some major challenges of operating commercially alongside a nonprofit. Uh, we have challenges that come in the legal area. It's illegal to mix donor and investor funding. Now some of these uh, will be specific to the American context or the Western context. But there will be principles in here that will apply across the board. Uh, we operate both out of the US where we have to follow legal uh, requirements. We also operate over in Central Asia where we have different legal requirements relating to nonprofit and commercial. Nevertheless, we have legal challenges that we have to meet. Uh, we have organizational culture challenges. Commercial culture is typically very different than a nonprofit culture. And then we have strategic challenges. We have very distinct goals that require distinct strategies. There are common solutions to these three problems. In the last uh, number of years, social enterprise has become a, a common um, um, approach to solving some of these things. And in social enterprise, typically you're subsuming the commercial under the nonprofit. So you have a nonprofit, um, let's say National Public Radio, or let's say Car Talk and the uh, Shamelessly Commercial Division on their website. 
They're a nonprofit, but they have an income generating component. And probably many of your nonprofits have an income generating component. A second way, though, to do it is to subsume a nonprofit under the commercial. So you have the Ben and Jerry's, uh, a blatantly commercial operation with a blatantly social agenda. Uh, they're, a, they're a business, and right from the beginning, they had a social goal um, to use their profits to further community goals. Then you have uh, a very common one of operating independently. You make as much money as you can, put it into a foundation, let the foundation do good. And uh, so you have both an independent operation, and then you have an operation that is dependent on the independent operation. So you're operating independently and in dependency. Um, and I don't know why I picked the biggest, most prominent one there as an example, but um, that's a very common approach. We have chosen to take a fourth route, and we're calling it tandem. I want to give my wife credit, Tammy, I didn't properly introduce you. This talk was originally going to be done by both of us with Tammy uh, giving the nonprofit side and me giving the commercial side due to uh, serious obligations. Tammy was not able to prepare with me, but she is here. Tammy, if you would just stand. Tammy is our regional director for the organization we represent, Ideas. We have a table over here in the next room. And uh, Tammy would love to interact with you, as I would, too. Um, Tammy came up with this uh, term, tandem, to describe what we're trying to do. Uh, all analogies fall down. But uh, the key point here is that we have two separate drivers, the commercial, the nonprofit. We have different goals, but we have the same objective. We're moving in the same direction. We have the same ultimate purpose. Uh, but we do indeed have different goals within those, and we have different drivers, different engines. Uh, they eat their granola bars at different rates, they uh, carry different amounts of water, um, et cetera, et cetera. So how does, what does this look like? We maintain distinct legal structures, funding sources, budgets, operations, and metrics. But we operate towards the same objective. A tandem model can, may successfully address three challenges, and we've found that, in fact, it does. It addresses the legal, the cultural, which is the organi organizational culture, and the strategic. And let's look a little bit more at what this looks like. It addresses the legal challenge. We have entirely separate legal entities. Ultimately, they're owned by the same entity at the top, and I'll show you a, a diagram in a moment. But there's no mixing of donor and investor funding. We stay completely clear and transparent in that regard. That may seem like a no-brainer, but actually it's not for those of you who work in nonprofit sphere. It answers the organizational culture challenge. Staff are allocated for their best cultural fit. Some of us are just born nonprofit people, and some of us just have to make money. Some of us want to make money and lose money. Some of us are born nonprofit and have that gift to make money. Nevertheless, there's these different cultural fits in organization, and this tandem model allows us to address that. Strategies and tasks are focused on different goals, the philanthropic vis-a-vis -vis the commercial. So what does this look like? I've shown our own diagram up here. We have a 501c3 U.S. nonprofit. 
the nonprofit owns the for-profit uh, that's working overseas, uh, that is the nonprofit project account, caharvest.org, representing our Central Asia Harvest Project. And then in Kazakhstan, we have a nonprofit registered under Kazakhstan law called Harvest, uh, represented in Russian by its Russian name Urajai. So the blue represents the nonprofit. On the other side of the tandem, we have in green there a USC Corporation, which is a holding company owned entirely by the nonprofit. And then that holding company owns, is a majority owner in a USA LLC, but that USA LLC also is able to take outside investment. And that's pretty key. So the US LLC. The USA LLC is able to operate as a separate commercial entity in its own right. And then in turn, the USA LLC is this, at this point the sole owner of the Kazakhstan LLP. And so we have these two sides of the tandem. And then the last point in there is the advisory board, which is really, really key. We started our advisory board when we only had the nonprofit. The advisory board is made up of Christian mission interested agricultural um, experts back here in the States, orchard farmers, typically, or with a business background. Very key that the advisory board uh, brings balance to the whole thing. Our commercial company, Middle Earth Orchards Group, its mission is to see profit made for investors and for sustainability of the tandem CHP project through establishing and operating a tree nursery with demonstration orchard establishing and operating a high-value fruit orchard, and the sales and marketing of what we're calling custom orchard package projects, where we offer basically a turnkey uh, solution to a landowner. The Middle Earth Orchard Group's business model aims to achieve, aims to maximize efficiency in an inefficient market, mitigate risk in a risky environment, mobilize human and technical resources in a resource poor culture, and measure success in the medium and long term in an unpredictable context. And let's look at these. First of all, we seek to ma maximize efficiency in an inefficient market. We employ state-of-the-art orchard technology alongside ancient methods. We are literally working with farmers who are using methods hundreds of years old. Uh, the interesting thing about this picture here is uh, one of our workers in our orchard and, and nursery is uh, using his uh, tried and true technology, especially in the winter and in the spring when there's thick mud. His donkey cart can get through when a tractor can't. But on the left of that picture, it doesn't maybe look like high tech. I'm sorry? I'm very sorry. Uh, can we back up one? Here we go. Um, so on the right hand of that picture, you see the donkey cart in the distance. Uh, that's supposed to be animated. If you push it again, uh, let's see, no, sorry. <laughs> Back up once more. <laughs> I apologize. The animation isn't working. Um, on the right hand side of that picture, you see the trellis of our orchard which is a modern intensive orchard of up to 3,300 trees per hectare. And it's uh, 
we get full growth in its first leaf. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. We can actually get fruit in the first leaf, but in the second leaf, definitely. Um, yeah, if you just get that playing there, Anil. So we have state-of-the-art apple orchard technology on the right, and we have coming down the row there uh, one of our workers in a donkey cart. It's, uh, we, we combine these two worlds, um, and, uh, and we're not making an effort to go slowly. This is on the commercial side, mind you. We're not going slowly with the farmers, moving them very slowly towards that high-tech option. We're actually showing it to them right away in the commercial context. On the nonprofit side, we can approach the farmers at any rate they want to go. On the commercial side, we head straight out to the, the latest technology that's out there. We introduce and utilize modern marketing practice in the face of subsistence mentality. So uh, an example of this is the current and future distribution opportunities for fruit. Even small-scale farmers are through supermarkets together with bazaars. No automated systems exist yet, so we use manual sorting and packaging to ensure quality control until sufficient volume exists uh, that automation can gradually be introduced. Uh, the picture is not very clear, but uh, you actually have um, a situation here where apples are being sorted in harvest and put into cartons when typically the way of harvesting is just dumping them in buckets, letting them fall any way, which way, and not doing any sorting and not doing any differentiation. So this is actually a major innovation for the farmers. But when on the 3,300 trees per hectare orchard, you're going to be getting 50 to 70 tons of apples per hectare versus 10 tons of apples per hectare. And so this system will move quite quickly, as we've seen in this country, but much more rapidly into an automated system of packaging and quality control. We mitigate risk in a risky environment. We have to do this. Well, the risks are pretty typical uh, of what you might expect. We have risks in, in uh, uh, typical risks for an agricultural model. We have weather, disease, and price. Uh, where we're working, we have the political risk. It's potentially unstable. We have corruption and uh, something called raiders who are well-placed politicians who will see your success and come in and take it by hook or by crook. Uh, you have a shortage of skilled labor and you have management combined with a high demand for those we train. In other words, we train people and then they leave <laughs> as soon as we train them. Competition, a uh, new industry with more players each year as, as things progress, uh, we're facing um, more and more competition. These are the risks we have to address. One of the ways we address them is integrating both vertically and horizontally. So for example, we didn't have appropriate roots, so we imported our own roots. Well, if we're gonna import our own roots for our own production, then why not sell those roots to contribute to the community, contribute to the economy? We're going to sell the roots, we're going to graft the roots, start a tree nursery, and go into tree sales as well as feeding our own operation. So we start an orchard, and we have to bring in equipment. It's a modern, remember, it's a modern commercial competitive orchard, so why not go into equipment sales? We have to train our own people, so why not sell orchard management services, training, and even orchard planning. 
So on the horizontal level, all these services, on the vertical level, going right up through to marketing and ultimately cold storage in there. And um, this is actually helping to mitigate risk where any one of these things could go bad, you're covering your risk in the other areas. We use legal structures to spread our risk around by distributing assets. So we're still a fairly small operation, but we have quite a number of companies already and organizations. So we have the nonprofit there, Harvest Public Fund. We actually form contracts, including the nonprofit, in order to secure the assets so that a raider can't come along and take them away from us. So we, we uh, use legal structures to spread risk. We, grow, we go slowly but steadily, varying the pace as needed to build strength. An apple season, you can't speed it up. It's just one year. Um, and so you have to go slowly, but, but we keep a steady pace in a commercial context. We recognize local solutions and use them when appropriate. So for example, a, there's a, a legal entity, of course, must pay taxes. However, a local grower doesn't want to pay taxes. The local grower, by, not, by being scared to and not wanting to pay taxes, has only the local market to sell to, and that's limited volume and a low price. The future is for him to sell, we're talking about apples now, which are transportable, storable. His future are markets far away. And so he's automatically, by refusing to pay taxes, he's automatically eliminating himself from that larger market opportunity. We can step in. The supermarket, meanwhile, is a legal entity and must pay taxes, and it wants to buy fruit. So it can't buy from the farmer who will not pay taxes. We step in in the middle, and we can buy from the farmer and pay the taxes, basically on behalf of the farmer, and build our economic model, and then sell to the supermarket. And so this is simply an example of how we can bring a local solution and use it when appropriate. Meanwhile, we mobilize human, we mobilize human and technical resources in a resource poor culture. So first of all, we collaborate with our nonprofit tandem partner, Harvest Public Fund, in training and R&D. So we have the nonprofit bringing a, the R&D and the training and it doesn't add overhead then to our commercial operation. We also use legal structures to leverage, we use legal structures as leverage to include and motivate local staff and communities. So for example, we have our commercial entity, Seven Rivers. We have a village landowner. We want to benefit him even in the commercial context. We have the nonprofit in the pink there, and we form a three-way contract where we lease land for the commercial entity, and we include three parties in that. We include the landowner, we include the commercial entity, Seven Rivers, and we include our nonprofit, and then we use that land for our commercial project. And what happens then is the village landowner, the contract includes a profit sharing so that the village landowner has an interest in seeing a long-term lease. He's not going to pull the land out from under us. He's going to see profit coming down the future based on that contract. A raider comes in from the outside, again the politically connected person who could take away our company, and this has already happened, and he can't because he's faced with three different entities in that legal structure. 
So it's not only mitigating the risk, but we're using these legal structures to motivate local staff and to get the community involved. We hire from outside and also promote from within. So for example, uh, we recognize innate ability and intelligence present in less educated employees. We delegate. Zofia from a village high school graduate uh, to office manager of our local LLP. Uh, she received from us English, computer skills, and management skills, and made a pretty quick promotional progress there. Ismail, unemployed village worker, right up to orchard manager, computer skills, orchard man management skills. And then we measure, and this is pretty key, measure success in the medium and long term in an unpredictable context. How do we do that? We attempt to capitalize for the full plan, but we build as resources allowed for the long term. Um, now for some of you, this, this, uh, these numbers will, be, um, uh, will seem very high, but uh, they re reflect the context in which we're operating the commercial. So if our total commercial capitalization would require 600,000 investment, and we, we can't find that. We start with whatever we have, which we've done. So we got 25,000 to start with. And then uh, we were able to get another 50K after we proved something. We got another 50K after we proved some more. We get a further 50K after we proved some more. And we're now actually starting to turn a corner where we're, dem we're, be we're able to demonstrate a 65% um, a 65% gross profit. And finally, be or getting close to the end here, we are ready to adapt. Um, on that SUV there, the sign says for sale or exchange for livestock. <laughs> and to persevere. Our progress to date, uh, we have built productive assets. Um, nursery with mother bed to produce 20,000 trees from 2012, reaching 100,000 in 2015, valued at an average $5 per tree price. This is reflecting real market there. Uh, our competition is from Holland and from Poland and from Belgium. So um, $5 per tree, $500,000 current market value. Uh, demonstration high production apple orchard to produce 130 tons of fruit. This is a small uh, five acre demonstration, but at, um, or, or two and a half, three, three hectare, uh, at 50 to 70 tons per hectare. 130 tons of fruit from 2015 valued at $1,000 per ton can bring in 130,000 current market value. Uh, intangible assets have been built, 10 years of positive government relationships, 10 years of positive reputation earned in the local industry and the training program, and 15 years of experience in local fruit production environment. I want to just uh, zip through some pictures here and leave some time for questions. <clears throat> 